Hey guys, welcome to Stories Untold Till Now, and I'm your host, Sun. Today, we have episode two of our serial killer files. Now let's get into it. Around the world, there are those who are deeply disturbed to the point where claiming the lives of others are considered an insignificant feat. Among those disturbed are serial killers who sometimes go unknown for years, or even centuries. The century-old elusive killer will be brought on light to this day, even if the cases are still unsolved. I'm talking about the one and only infinite, infamous Jack the Ripper, the man who ripped through the streets of Whitechapel and Spitalfields, London. There's little known regarding his identity. The only thing that is known for sure is that all of his targets were prostitutes. There are five victims of him of his that are 100% linked to him, but there could be more to this day. Some say less than four, no more than eight. It's a really weird analogy they got going on there, but that's what they said. <laughs> Alright, so before we dive into the details of his victims, I feel like background information on Jack is important. The name Jack the Ripper originates from a letter written by someone who claimed to be the killer published at the time of the murders. Um, this was claimed by casebook.org. Jack the Ripper is his prominent name, but others called him the White Chapel Murder and Leather Apron. It's White Chapel, sorry. There's sometimes that my tongue goes to White Chapel, so forgive me for saying it like that. <laughs> All right. Well, Jack didn't start terrorizing the streets of London until early August of 1888. Once more, I stress that there could have been more victims and some claim that there were more, but some were killed earlier than what is suggested or believed. Regardless, there isn't much information on those possibilities, so I'll stick on to the facts of the case and which victims were actually confirmed to be done by his hand. The first victim Jack claimed was a woman by the name of Mary Ann Nicholas, or known by her nickname, Polly for short. She was murdered on a Friday. It was August 31st of 1888. There's an actual photograph of her murder, but for obvious reasons, I will not show them on screen above and will stick to illustrations of her image, preferably one that she'd rather have everyone see if she was still alive. Mary Ann Nicholas was born on August 26th of 1845 on Dean Street in London. Her last name was Walker before she married William Nicholas, who was a printer mechanist in 1864. The couple had five children together, three boys and two girls. It wasn't until September 6th of 1880 where the couple seemed to have continuous marital problems that would cause them to separate. William took four out of his five children to live with him on Old Kent Road. According to Wikipedia, Mary's father accused William of leaving his daughter after he had conducted an affair with a nurse who had attended to the birth of their fifth child. Though William Nicholas claimed to have proof that their marriage had continued at least three years after the date of this alleged affair, claiming their marital problems had been caused by his wife's heavy drinking and that he had only embarked upon an affair after Nicholas had left him. He later maintained uh, to the authorities that his wife had deserted him and was practicing prostitution. Over the following years, Nicholas amassed a lengthy police record. Although all her arrests were for minor offenses such as drunkenness, disorderly conduct, and prostitution, throughout the years of 1881 to 1887, Mary's location was sometimes hard to follow as there were gaps in her locations or appearances, so for blimps of time, her location would literally be unknown. She is known to work at Lambeth Workhouse before leaving for the unknown reasons, um, excuse me, before leaving for unknown reasons, and then returning to Lambeth in 1882. So she started in 1881, took a break for a few months, and then came back in 1882. During this time, she mostly resided with her father, and since the divorce was extremely, was extremely hard to get back then, her husband still had to send her um, money, so he sent her five shillings a week as an allowance, and then stopped after finding out she was um, to be a prostitute. She tried to get the authorities involved so that she could so that she can co keep collecting payment. But when they did step in and they talked to Williams, he had explained how now all their children reside with him. She essentially abandoned him. She lived with another man who was unknown and she was a prostitute. Due to all this, um, he felt like he shouldn't have to owe her a single cent and the police agreed. The police sided with Williams and Mary was effectively cut off from all the support she received from him. In any case, if you were wondering what five shillings is, it's roughly $19.49 in U.S. dollar terms. This is what the estimated conversion rate is for the 1800s. In today's uh, time, five shillings is worth from $11 to $35. I try to find an accurate estimation, but for some reason, everything heavily varied. So if anyone knows how much five shillings would be worth today, then please comment below. Much appreciated. Now, returning to the topic of Mary, however, Mary continued to fumble back and forth between different workhouses and even returned to Lambeth for less than two weeks. 
On the 30th to the 31st of August, Mary stayed at the Flower and Dean Street lodging house. When she entered the innkeeper, she told or excuse me, when she entered, the innkeeper told her that she owed four shillings for a room that she, by the way, was sharing with an old woman by the name of Emily Holland. That's right. They actually actually had to um, share an actual bed together. Like there are two ladies sleeping in one bed and she paid four shillings for that share bed. I'm not sure if that was normal back then, but I'm pretty sure I guess that's the best she could do. Um, Mary smiled and took and told the innkeeper that she'd be right back. She was no doubt going to sell herself so that she could afford the lodging. She was last seen alive on August 31st at 1.30 a.m., walking towards Whitechapel Road. Mary's body was discovered at 3.40 a.m. by a carman named Charles Allen Cross. At first, he thought it was a, um, a tarp lying on the ground in front of a gated stable entrance in Bucks Row, Whitechapel, as he walked to his place of employment in Broad Street. In some cases, um, for you guys... So there's, you know, the, the big tarps. I, for some reason, I had to explain it because in the reports, it actually says tarpaulin, which I didn't know. It's basically a tarp. So I just wanted to give you um, that actual word just in case I have other viewers who don't know what a tarpaulin is, but know what a tarp is and vice versa. Anyway, back to the stories. Um, Mary's body was found on the ground. She laid on her back with her eyes open, her legs were straight, her skirt was raised above her knees, and her left hand touched the gate of the stable entrance. No doubt, whatever she saw scared her, and she's probably tried to enter the gate in which she laid her hand on. Although there are no mentions of screaming heard, I would be sincerely upset if it was like the Kitty Genovese case, where the woman was stabbed over 60 times, and her neighbors, who were witnesses, by the way, um... They all witnessed a man come to stab her, and then they left when they noticed that the neighbors were watching, and then he returned to finish her off when he realized the neighbors weren't doing anything. And my grievance with that case for Jenny uh, Kitty Genovese is that nobody called the cops because they assumed someone else would. The only reason why I bring another case to this case is because I'm wondering if someone had saw and then simply was shocked or... If, um, you know, people thought, oh, someone else will take care of it. You know what I mean? But that itself is a whole other topic that boiled my core. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Mary was found to have two deep knife wounds inflicted to her throat. An investigator say she could have not been more than 30 minutes dead as her body was still warm. I find the timing of all of this, like, really insane. She was found at 3.40 a.m. Clearly, some people were starting work, but does that mean there was a close shave between the man who found her and the killer like imagine if he came across the scene as she's being killed then what like there's two options here jack would either run away or kill him regardless the man who found her i believe is extremely lucky her body was soon to be moved to the mortuary the coroner's report stated that both sides of her face had been bruised by either a fist or a pressure of a thumb before her throat wounds had been inflicted from left to right one of these two wounds measured eight inches and the other four inches in length both reached back to her vertebral column her vagina had been stabbed twice. Her abdomen had mutilated with one deep, jagged wound two or three inches from the left side. Several incisions had also been inflicted across her abdomen, causing her bowels to protrude among the wounds. Really gross. Um, and three or four similar cuts ran down the right side of her body. These cuts had also been inflicted with the same knife, estimated to be at least six to eight inches, uh, 15 to 20 centimeters long, and possibly a cork cutter or shoemaker's knife. Each wound had been inflicted in a violent and downward thrusting manner. No organs were missing. The coroner believed with this fashion of killing that the murder had to have some type of knowledge of the body as his hits seemed to be very precise. Um, her body was identified by an old car worker from the Lambeth workhouse and Emily, whom she shared her bed with. I feel like it's sad that the people who were able to identify her was Emily or her co-worker. I know that she had she was estranged with her husband, but at least I thought he would come out to try to identify her, but I guess not. One notable thing on the report was that there were there was very little blood at the scene. The coroner said that there was enough blood to fill about two large wine glasses. There was an ongoing investigation, but because of the lack of witnesses or key suspects, the case remained unsolved. On September 6, 1888, Mary was laid to rest in the afternoon and was taken to the city of London Cemetery. The people who showed up for her funeral was her father, her strange children, and three or <laughs> her estranged husband and three out of five children. Um, regarding the children, I can't blame them for possibly being bitter towards their mother as, you know, that may serve why two of them didn't go see her as they were being laid to, as she was being laid to rest. Um, Mary Ann Nicholas was only 42 when she died. 
Wow, that was a lot going through. I sympathize with Mary because there could have been more underlying conditions that caused her to essentially lose her way in self. The whole story around her honestly seems like she was always troubled, but I haven't found anything explicitly describing her youth. But I feel like a downward spiral to happen so quickly, there may be more than just an unfaithful marriage happening. What do you guys think? Now we move to the second victim. Her name was Annie Chapman. She was murdered on a Saturday, September 8th, 1888. She was born with the name Eliza Ann Smith on September 25th of 1840. But for this video, I'll keep referring to her as Annie. Annie's troubles would start when she was young. Her brother's her brother Fountain, yes, that's his name, <laughs> he would state that she had tasted alcohol at a very young age and would soon become very addicted to it. Her siblings would try to dissuade her, but she kept falling into temptation and continued to consume alcohol no matter how many times she said she wanted to stay away. Honestly, I want to know how she got the alcohol. Either way, it's just bad parenting, or if the siblings gave her some, then either way, shame on all of them as the brother obviously knew when she had her first drink, so... <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> Annie was married on May 1st of 1869 to a man named John James Chapman, who, by the way, was related to her mother. I couldn't find the exact relation, but the fact that they shared blood itself is odd, but not uncommon for uncommon for back then. Annie and John had three children together, two girls and one boy. Their son was born a cripple, meaning um, he had some type of physical disability. The Chapman sought medical help for their son, John at the London Hospital before leading him, later placing him in the care of an institution for the physically disabled close to Windsor. It was reported that Annie was able to rid of her alcohol dependency due to her son being crippled and therefore focusing more efforts on him. However, misfortune struck the family on November 21st, 1882. Their eldest daughter, Emily, would die at the age of 12 on her brother's birthday due to meningitis. The death of their daughter had caused major depression to rut in Annie and her husband, John. They both took to heavy drinking to cope with her death. Over the following years, she is known to have been arrested on several occasions for public in intoxication in both Kluwer and Windsor, though no records exist of her being ever brought before a court for these arrests. My personal opinion is that the police either felt bad and didn't want to record it, or they simply failed to continue with the paperwork or show evidence to the judge. Either or. Chapman and her husband uh, separated by mutual consent in 1884. John retained custody of their surviving daughter while Annie relocated to London. Her husband was obliged to pay her a weekly allowance of 10 shillings via post office order. The precise reason for the couple's separation is unknown, although a later police report lists the reason for the separation as Annie Chapman's drunken and immoral ways. After their separation, Annie would move to Whitechapel where she would stay at the Crossing Hymns Lodging House. According to the Lodging House deputy, Timothy Donovan, a 47-year-old bricklayer's laborer named Edward the Pensioner, Stanley, would typically stay with Chapman at the lodging house between Saturday and Monday, occasionally paying for her bed. She earned some income from crochet work, making antimacassars, I think that's how you say that, and selling flowers, and of course supplemented by casual prostitution. She stayed in a room that had a double bed and paid eight shillings a night. Like Mary, Annie was short on lodging money, so she went walking towards Spitafield Market, no doubt to find work and to pay her lodging. What happens next is interesting as I believe this is the most accurate description that we can get on Jack the Ripper. According to the testimony by Miss Elizabeth Long, she had observed Chapman walking with a man at 5.30 a.m. The two stood beyond the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, Spitafields. Long described the man as being over 40 years old, slightly taller than Chapman, dark hair and a possibly foreign shabby gentle appearance he was wearing a brown low crowned felt hat and possibly a dark court a uh, coat <laughs> according to long the man had asked chapman the question will you to which chapman had replied yes no doubt the question was referring whether or not annie would accompany him annie was found at 6 a.m by an elderly resident of 29 hanbury street named john davis her body was lying on the ground near the doorway of the backyard with her head six inches or 15 centimeters from the steps of to the property. Davis quickly reported the findings to the nearest police station. Annie had also suffered two deep slashes, two deep slash wounds, excuse me, to the throat, inflicted from the left to the right of her neck before the murder had mutilated her abdomen and had a blade of similar size and design that had been used in both murders. Phillips also discovered six areas of blood splattering upon the wall of the house between the steps and wooden paling dividing the 27th and 29th Hanbury Street. Um, Phillips is a man who would inspect these victims um in this one this is his victim that he inspected essentially he helped the coroner 
Nearby, two pills which Chapman had been prescribed for a lung condition, a section of a torn envelope, a small piece of fried coarse muslin, and a comb were recovered close to her body. A leather apron, partially submerged in dishwater, located close to the tap, was also discovered close to her body. No doubt this is where Jack the Ripper got his other name of the leather apron murder. Murder. <laughs> Once more, the investigation turned up as a cold case, as the person in question was never caught and is still unknown, and he was buried shortly after 9 a.m. on September 14, 1888, in a service paid for by her family. She was laid to rest in a communal grave with Manor Park Cemetery, Forest Gate, east of London, and he was only 40 years old when she died. Okay, now for the third victim. The third victim was named Elizabeth Stride. Her murder was on Sunday, September 30th of 1888. I find it curious how Mary died Friday, Annie died Saturday, and now Elizabeth died Sunday. He should be called the weekend killer at this point. Unlike the other victims, at least three of whom resorted to prostitution due to poverty following failed marriages, Stride became a prostitute earlier in life. Gothenburg police reports uh, dating from March 1865, confirming her arrest upon this charge. She was treated at least twice for venereal disease, aka STDs, and on the 21st of April, 1865, Elizabeth gave birth to a stillborn girl. On the 7th of March, 1869, Elizabeth married John Thomas Stride, a ship's carpenter from the Shurnas, who was 22 years her senior. They married at St. Giles in the Fields Church. The couple had no children. Her and her husband had an on-and-off relationship. They were divorced, but would sometimes get back together and then separate. It was just one of those relationships where they seemed to love each other and hate each other, and they just couldn't get enough of each other. So, following an argument on September 26, 1888, Elizabeth and her husband again separated, and she again took residence at 32 Flower and Dean Street, the then-notorious slum and criminal rookery. On September 30th of 1888, at 12.35 a.m., William Smith saw stride with a man wearing a hard felt hat standing opposite the International Working Men's Educational Club, a socialist and predominantly Jewish social, social club, at 40 Burner Street, since renamed as Enrique Street <laughs> in White Chapel, or White Chapel. The man was carrying a package about 18 inches or 45 centimeters long. Having no reason to feel suspicious, Smith continued on his direction to, of Commercial Road. Between 12.35 a.m. and 12.45 a.m., dock worker James Brown saw a woman he believed to be Elizabeth standing with her back against the wall at the corner of Burner Street speaking with a man of average build in a long black coat. Brown heard Elizabeth said, No, not tonight, some other night. At approximately 1 a.m. on Sunday, September 30th of 1888, in an adjacent Dutchfield yard, Elizabeth was found by Louis Demschutz, the steward of the International Working Men's Educational Club. Demschutz had driven into the poorly illuminated yard with his horse and two-wheeled cart, when his horse abruptly shielded to the left to avoid what appeared to be a, a bundle lying on the ground. Noting that, noting what he later described as a dark object laying on the ground, Dishmutz unsuccessfully attempted to lift the object with his whip handle before leaving his cart to inspect it. Upon lighting a match, Dishmutz saw a prone body. He immediately ran inside the club to check if his wife was safe. After finding her safe and sound, he reported his discovery before the group promptly dispersed to seek help. That's actually sweet, not gonna lie, the fact that he went to check on his wife first. The body was laying on the near side with the face turned toward the wall. With head up the yard and feet toward the street, the left arm was extended and there was a packet of catches in the left hand. The right arm was over the belly, the back of the hand and wrist had it on clotted blood, the legs were drawn up with the feet close to the wall, the body and face were warm, and the hand were cold. The legs were still warm. There was a clear cut incision on the neck, it was about six inches in length, and comm commenced two and a half inches in a straight line before the angle of the jaw. Phillips, who had helped the coroner with the body, stated that Elizabeth had probably been lying on her back when she was killed by a single swift slash wound from left to right across her neck, strongly indicating that the murderer had been right-handed. Bruising on Stride's chest suggested that she had been pinned to the ground prior to the work, I mean, prior to the wound on her neck being inflicted. Although she suffered no mutilation, they connected her to Jack due to the similar killings of being slashed across the neck by what seemed to be the same blade. Elizabeth Stride was buried on Saturday, October 6, 1888, in the East London Cemetery, located within East London District of Plaistow. She was only 45. The next victim is Catherine Eddowes. She was actually murdered the same date, 
Catherine Eddowes was born in Graysley Green, Wolverhampton, on the 14th of April, 1842. Catherine had relations with two men. The one she ended up being with was a name was a man named John Kelly. In the early afternoon of September 29th, Eddowes informed Kelly of her intention to travel to Bernmondsey to attempt to borrow some money from her daughter, whom, by 1888, had been married to a gunmaker in South Walker for three years. The two parted company in Houndsditch at about 2 p.m., with Eddowes informing Kelly that she expected to return by 4 p.m. At 8.30 p.m. on Saturday, the 29th of September, Lewis Frederick Robinson, who is a cop, by the way, observed a small group of people converge outside number 29 Aldegate High Street. Approaching the crowd, Eddowes lying drunk on the pavement. Robinson assisted Eddowes to her feet and leaned her against the shutters of the house. Although she rapidly slumped back to the pavement, summoning the assistance of George Simmons, the two took her into custody at Bishop's Gate Police Station to be detained until she, had sober, she was sober enough to leave. Upon her arrival, Eddowes gave her name as Nothing, and within 20 minutes, she had fallen asleep in her cell. Shortly after 12.30 a.m. on the morning of September 30th, Eddowes asked uh, George Hutt when she could be released. In response, Hutt replied, when you, are capable, when you are capable of taking care of yourself. 30 minutes later, at 1 a.m., Eddowes was deemed sober enough to be released, stating to Hutt as he exhorted her to the entrance of Bishop, Bishop, Bishop's Gate Police Station. <laughs> she was last seen alive in narrow walkaway named Church Passage at 1.35 a.m. At 1.44 at 1.44 a.m., Eddowes mutilated and disemboweled body was found lying on her back with her head resting on a coal hole and turned toward the left shoulder in the southwest corner of Mitra Square by the square's beat policeman. Edwards Watkins, who was a police officer, approximately 14 minutes after had previously passed through the square at 1.30 a.m. Upon discovering Eddowes' body, Watkins called for assistance from the night watchman at Curley and Tong Warehouse, which bordered Mitra Square. Ex-policeman George James Morris. Morris had been sweeping the lands inside the warehouse within the door of the square open. And when Watkins knocked on the door, exclaiming, For God's sake, mate, come to my assistance. After viewing the body, he informed Watkins that he had noted nothing unusual that evening. I will not go into detail over the body of her condition. That's something that you can Google yourself. There are also pictures online. The way she was mutilated is actually quite horrific. So I suggest if you have a weak stomach, don't look at the pictures. Um, I am not going to put any pictures up there for her for her privacy sake because, you know, like, I, I don't think that's something she'd want up here. Um, what I find uh, hard to believe, and I'm pretty sure everyone else at this time found hard to believe, was that no one saw this happen, not even heard it. The, not even the officer who regularly checked the grounds, like, at night heard nothing. I mean... To me, it makes a bit of sense because Jack seems smart at this point. He probably surveyed the area at, night, at nights before learning the routine of all the cops, and maybe particularly this cop if it was the same one monitoring the streets every night. Um, I mean, that wouldn't be too far of a far-fetched theory, you know what I mean, for Jack to monitor the streets and then take his victim to that isolated area. What do you guys think? Um, due to the location of Mitra Square, the City of London Police, under the command of Detective Inspector James McWilliam, Join the existing Metropolitan Police Manhunt to identify and apprehend the perpetrator. A house-to-house -house search was conducted by the city police, but nothing suspicious or of use to the inquiry was found. Catherine Eddowes was buried on the afternoon of October 8th, which was a Monday of 1888. She was only 43. And now for the final victim of Jack the Ripper. Her name was Mary Jane, or Mary Jeanette Kelly who was murdered Friday, November 9th of 1888. Mary Kelly's origins are obscured and undocumented. Much of this information is possibly embellished. Kelly may have fabricated many details of her life as there's no corroborated documentary evidence or to prove whether or not she was from one place or another. According to Joseph Barnett, the man she had recently lived with prior to her murder, Kelly had told him she was born in Limerick, Ireland in around 1863, although whether she referred to the city or the country is not known, and that her family moved to Wales when she was a child. That That's about it. That's all we know background-wise. Kelly had been reported uh, um, as being a blonde or redhead, although her nickname was Black Mary, suggests that she had dark hair. 
Um, her eyes were blue. To some, Kelly was known as Fair Emma, although it is unknown whether it applies to hair color or skin color, her beauty, or other qualities. Some contemporary newspapers report she was nicknamed Ginger after her hair, though some sources disagree even on this point, thus leaving the description of hair color ranging from ash blonde to dark chestnut. Basically, she looked like anyone if you just thought hard enough. <laughs> Um, when Kelly was aged approximately 16 in about 1879, she reportedly married a coal miner named Davy Davis or Davies, who was killed two or three years later in a mo- mining explosion. Without any means of financial support, Kelly re- relocated to Cardiff, where she lived with a cousin. Although there are no contemporary records of Kelly's presence in Cardiff, it is at this stage in her life that Kelly is considered that she has begun her career as a prostitute, possibly introduced to this profession by her cousin. She was never arrested as there's no records to show um, that she was. So it's a maybe at this point. We just know that she was a prostitute for sure. On April 8th of 1887, she became acquainted with 28-year-old Joseph Barnett, whom she first encountered on Commercial Street. Barnett, who worked as a fish porter at Bill's Gate Market, took Kelly for a drink before arranging to meet her the following day. These two hit it off quickly, decided to live together. They did get kicked out of a lodge for disorderly conduct, um, which mainly came from both of them being very drunk. (laughs) On the 8th of November, Barnett visited Kelly for the last time between 7 and 8 p.m. On the 8th of November, he found her in the company of a friend of hers named Maria Harvey. Um, Barnett did not stay at the property for long and apologized for having no money to give her. Both he and Harvey left Miller's Court at about the same time. Fellow Miller's Court resident and prostitute, 31-year-old Marianne Cox, who described herself as a widow and unfortunate, reportedly seeing Kelly returning home drunk and in the company of a stout, ginger-haired man, approximately aged 36, at 11.45 p.m. This man was wearing a black felt bowler hat, had a thick mustache, blotches on his face, and was carrying a can of bee. A beer. Excuse me. Cox and Kelly wished each other good night, and Kelly adding, I'm gonna have I'm going to have a song. Kelly then entered her room with the man who closed the door as Cox returned to her own lodgings at Five Miller's Court. Kelly was heard singing the song, A Violet from Mother's Grave. She was singing when Cox left her lodging at the ni- at midnight and when she returned approximately one hour later at 1 a.m. Elizabeth Pratter resided in the room directly above Kelly when she went to bed at 1.30 a.m. and then the singing had stopped. On the morning of of the November 9th, 1888, the day of the annual Lord Mayor's Day celebration, Kelly's landlord, John McCarthy, sent his assistant, ex-soldier, Thomas Breuer, to collect the rent. Kelly was six weeks behind on payments, owing 29 shillings. Shortly after 10.45 a.m., Breuer knocked on her door but received no response. He then attempted to turn the handle only to discover the door was locked. Boyer then looked through the keyhole but could not see anybody in the room. Pushing aside the cloth used to plug the broken window pane and the muslin curtains which covered the windows, Boyer appeared inside the room, discovering Kelly's extensively mutilated cords lying on the bed. She was believed to have died between three and nine hours before the discovery of her body. One thing to note is that the same day, an unemployed laborer, George Hutchinson, who knew Kelly, reported that the two of them met around 2 a.m. on November 9th on Flower and Dean Street and that Kelly asked him for a loan of sixpence. Hutchinson claimed to be broke, having spent his money in Romford the previous day. He later stated that Kelly walked in the direction of Thrall Street. She was approached by a Jewish appearance man and aged about 34 35 hutchinson claimed he was suspicious of this man because although kelly seemed to know him this individual's opulent appearance made him suspicious made him a suspicious character to be in the neighborhood the man had also made an obvious effort to disguise his features from hutchinson by hiding down his head with his hat over his eyes as the two had passed him Kelly's body is the most mutilated or horribly messed up body out of them all. Once more, if you search this up for yourself, I demand you take great caution as these images can cause one great nightmares or anxiety. The coroner believed that Kelly had been killed by a slash in the throat and the mutilations performed afterwards. Phillips, who looked at the body, believed that in each case the mutilations were inflicted by a person who had no scientific nor anatomical knowledge. In my opinion, he does not even possess the technical knowledge of a butcher or horse slaughter or a person accustomed to cut up dead animals, as stated as um, as stated by Philip. Kelly's death certificate was issued on the 17th of November. This document records her name as Marie Jeanette Kelly and lists her age about 25 years. Mary Jane Kelly was buried at 2 p.m. Monday on November 19th, 1888. 
she was laid to rest in St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Century Cemetery in Laidestone. Yeah, in Laidestone. Uh, services were officiated by the Reverend Father Columban because her la- her past lays in such obscurity. No relatives were found or known, so no one, so none of her family showed up. Um, if she indeed had one, only people who apparently knew her, like you know her fellow coworkers, I guess you would call them, would show up. The case was deemed closed in 1892, and I mean like all five of these victims' cases, they just said we're going to close in 1892. However, there's still no identity to Jack the Ripper. Although the police had over 100 suspects, there's insufficient evidence to link any one of them to the crime. An interesting theory is that Jack the Ripper either came from an Irish descent or an American descent. This is due to the fact that there were letters sent to the police on October 1st and another on October uh, 16th. Some say the one letter sounds more Irish while the other one sounds more American. One of the letters was delivered with half a kidney. The first letter is titled Dear Boss and goes as follow. I was not coddling dear old boss when I gave you the tip. You heard about saucy Jackie's work. Tomorrow double event this time. Number one squealed a bit. Couldn't finish straight off. Ha. Not the time to get ears for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. That's when I said like one of the letters had the name Jack the Ripper and that's where they got it from. That's that letter. The second letter is is named Letter from Hell. It says the following. From Hell, Mr. Lusk, Sor, I send you half a kidney I took from one woman and perceived it for you. Tore another piece a Friday, ate it. It was very nice. I may send you a bloody knife that took it out if you only watch, wait a, w- a while longer. By the way, the way I'm reading it is the way it's written. <laughs> Signed, Catch Me When You Can, Mr. Lusk. Both letters are debated all the time, as some believe are real, some believe they're hoax. Some believe it could be a copycat. One thing for certain is that these letters had the name Jack the Ripper, and that's why we have the name Jack the Ripper. What do you guys think? Do you guys think these letters are real? Do you guys think these letters are fake? Tell me in the comments why. Now, for the finale. The most popular theory to date is that Jack the Ripper's identity is most likely H.H. Holmes. No, not Sherlock Holmes, like some of you are trying to connect the names with. H.H. Holmes is an infamous American serial killer who terrorized Chicago through his elaborate maze of death traps built into a massive three-story hotel that took up the entire block of 63rd and Wallace Streets. His death hotel became known as the Murder Castle. Holmes confessed to killing 27 people. However, the true number is believed to be over 200. The reason why they believe Holmes could have been Jack the Ripper is because Jeff Mudgett, a lawyer and former commander in the U.S. Naval Reserve claims that his great-great-grandfather, H.H. Holmes, was in fact Jack the Ripper. The Ripper. Mudgett based his assertions on the writings in two diaries he inherited, he inherited from Holmes, which details Holmes' participation in the murder and mutilation of numerous prostitutes in London. The issue is that there's a lack of evidence because more, um, once more, the letters have yet to be seen as authentic or not. Same with the diary. And the issue... Also, is that the evidence has to be on par. You know what I mean? They haven't figured out whether or not these letters are real. They haven't figured out handwriting or anything. Um, Regards to anything else in that theory, there hasn't been much coming forward other than H.H. Holmes might be, and that's about it. Um, With all that said, 134 years later, we still don't know the identity of Jack the Ripper. And we probably never will. And that's it. (laughs) If you guys really like this story, or not really story, if you like this mini docu that I did, please leave a like, subscribe, and let me know down in the comments what you thought. Like, I really like the feedback that you guys give me. I'm always up for critiques as it's the only way to make me uh, better. Anyway, stay sunny, friends. Thank you.